I'd like you to welcome uh, for our next OBMX talk, uh, one of our all-stars from the past who's actually started a new company, uh, co-founder of the Brave Group. Please welcome Melissa Hamilton. <laughs> if we're going to get those slides up there. It's titled, is she looking at me? And the answer is, yes, I am. <laughs> Each and every one of you. As a CEO leading teams of 5,000 incredible people globally, I can tell you without a doubt that Great Game of Business was the foundation for our success. It was what enabled us when we sold the company and we played the game for 22 years. It's what enabled us to sell the company at a multiple of 12 when the industry was selling at a multiple of six. It also taught us how to count our beans. It taught us how to teach everyone else to count our beans. It taught us to teach everyone else how to make more beans and then how to share those beans when we made more. What it didn't teach us right in the beginning was perhaps what our critical number was. Great game of business takes a lot of discipline. Anything worth doing well takes a lot of discipline. This is a story of when we lost some of that and then when we found it again. It's a story of rapid growth from zero to two and a half thousand employees in our first 10 years. And it's a story of not quite keeping up. Hands up, who knows what their critical number is in the room? Hands up, who's still looking for their critical number? And hands up, who's picked one, but there's something in your gut saying perhaps it's not the right number. Okay, I remember the original open book management video. If you've never seen it, go and find it on YouTube. I remember trench coat man standing in an empty factory saying, there used to be a lot of people here. Do you want me to do that again in American? There used to be a lot of people here. <laughs> Our story was a little different. Our story was, there's a lot of people here leaving and new people leaving again and new people. In this room, I think there's about 500 people. Take a good look around at the people at your table. In five minutes, you'll all be leaving and there'll be new people coming in to take your seats. Don't get too comfortable because in another five minutes, you'll be going again and then coming back again. That's what we were doing. Can you imagine welcoming, recruiting, welcoming, training, and bringing in that number of people four times a year? That's what we were doing. And we convinced ourselves that this wasn't really a problem. This was just what happened in our industry. We're in the call center industry. All we had was people. We didn't make anything. We were selling the services those people could deliver. And we just normalized that number of people coming and going. And I stepped into the role of CEO in 2010 about 10 years into our operation. And at the time, we had declining profit margins. We had a massive major key client dependency. 85% of our income came from one client. And we had employees leaving in rapid numbers. And I joined an external mentoring group at the time. In Australia, it was called Tech. Here in the US, I believe it's called Vistage. And every month, we would have the chance to go and meet with a group of like-minded peers, and we would talk about our business and our challenges and our opportunities, and we would present uh, to them as a group. And it was my turn to go and present our business plan. I pumped up that presentation with every bit of good news I could find, and there was some. 
So in I went with this terrific plan about how I was going to grow and diversify our client base. I had all these incredible things from the tiny green shoots that were emerging in our business, and I nailed the presentation. And then I left the room, and they talked about our business while I was out of the room. I came back in, and they said to me, brilliant presentation, Melissa. Excellent. We're really confident you're going to deliver that. But isn't the real issue in your business all the people that are leaving? And in that moment, I wished the floor would open up and swallow me. I felt so embarrassed. Here I was, a CEO leading a business when no one wanted to stay. And we had totally normalized that that happened. We convinced ourselves that that was just the way business was in our industry. No one stays in the call center. Everyone else has those problems. Our competitors have those problems too. We'd even started reporting the number differently in our business. Let's not count anyone who leaves in the first 90 days. I mean, we were completely kidding ourselves about those numbers. We were a good Great game of business organization. We knew exactly what it cost us when we lost an employee and had to replace one. Eight and a half thousand beans. And so we all knew that and we all had that conversation. And that day it all changed for me. That day, oh, sorry, I just wanted the next slide to come up. I don't know if you guys can see that. Can you see, can you see that little person in there? Once you see it, you can't unsee it. And that was how I felt that day. Our critical number was people, retaining people. And we'd been looking everywhere else. Our critical number was so obvious that we couldn't see it. And even when we did talk about it, we were talking about it in financial terms. And I changed the narrative that day. I went back to our organization and I said to our team, I want to be the leader of a business where people are choosing to stay. We had been measuring attrition, turnover. We had been measuring people who were leaving. We instantly changed to retention and started measuring the people who were staying. And we changed our narrative. The next thing I needed to do was find the owner. Who owned retention in our business? I had the pleasure yesterday of presenting to a group of leaders here, and I asked them that question, who owns retention in your business? And I gave them multiple choice. The most popular answer was everyone, but we struggled to get an answer. And I would say to all of you, as I said to that group yesterday, if everyone owns it, then no one is accountable for it. So who is the owner? In our business, we had all these beliefs about why people were leaving. We're an outsourcer. We can't pay a really competitive salary, so we can't compete with other businesses. So it must be pay. You know, we had a list. We had a shopping list of beliefs about why people were leaving. What it really boiled down to was the relationship they had with their direct manager. And in our business, we had over 200 frontline managers, and each of them had teams of 15 employees. And they were the owners. And I, I ran a competition, a mini game, for all 200 of those frontline leaders. The response I got from that told me everything I needed to know. And that first question was, why us? Can we get that slide up again? Why is she looking at us? We don't own it. When employees leave, we just reach out to HR or people and culture and we just order up another 10. We don't own retention. I split it into two, and I put thousands of dollars on this because I needed to make it meaningful and I needed it to be what everyone in the company was talking about, literally thousands of dollars. Two winners, three months, the most improved retention across that period and the best retention across that period. Everyone had a chance to win. And off we went. And that changed the conversation for us in our organisation and it gave us the chance to have a really meaningful conversation about leadership and the style of leaders that we needed. 
to engage our employees in the business. The next part of the presentation is where it gets really sexy. This is where we put a framework in place. This is where the discipline comes in. Sorry for anyone that thought it legitimately was going to get sexy at this point. <laughs> when you make a decision about your culture and about your people and about the non-negotiable things that you have to do to support people in your business and to support them to stay, how do you make sure everyone else understands that? We had a challenge of scaling and scaling quickly. And so whilst we had a leadership team, a core leadership team who understood great game of business well, they might have been a bit rusty at playing it, but they understood it well, we had to translate that across thousands of employees. And we had to make sure that those commitments that we were sharing with our people were going to be upheld. And so my question to each of you is, as you grow, how can you measure the commitments you're making to your people? How can you make sure that they're being translated properly? How can you make sure that your culture is not a water cooler conversation? that you're in control of the things that matter to support your culture. And so the final thing, the three takeaways for you today, firstly, make sure you know your critical number. Is it to do with your people? Is it so obvious that you can't see it? Have you normalised something going on in your business that perhaps you need someone external to take a look at to give you a view of? Secondly, Find the true owner. Find the people in your business who can have the biggest impact and shift that number quickly. As I said before, if everyone owns it, no one's accountable for it. Make sure you're clear on that. And then the last one, don't let your culture become a water cooler conversation. Make sure you're in control of that and make sure you do know that those non-negotiable commitments that you want to make to your people to retain them in this very challenging climate with employees, make sure that you understand exactly how your culture is being interpreted at all levels of your business. I wish you guys a wonderful, wonderful day and thank you for having me.